So I've spent a great deal of time in the last few years studying CAR T-cell therapy in patients with relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma. And something particular of interest to me is looking at the post-FDA approval, what has been the integration of CAR T-cell therapy into patients, recognizing that the patients that were enrolled on the prospective phase two studies were generally very good patients, meaning good performance status. They had disease that was stable enough to allow them to be enrolled on a trial at a referring center. Now that we have two FDA approved products, we really want to know does the efficacy hold up in a potentially sicker or more unstable patient population? So we've set out to try and explore what are the standard of care outcomes with CAR T cell therapy, recognizing that this is a unique therapy that is not available to a lot of patients. Also, it um, can result in high healthcare uh, resource utilization. So I think there are a number of interesting questions that can be asked. So last year at the ASH meeting, we set out to report on the first patients treated across 17 centers in the U.S. post FDA approval. Now most of those patients had, all of them actually, had received AxiCell, which is a CD28 co-stimulatory polygus CD19 CAR T cell therapy, and that was because it was the first FDA approved product for a relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma in the U.S. And so we pulled data from 17 centers and we had nearly 300 patients that had undergone leukapheresis with the intent to manufacture and administer this therapy. What well, was quite striking out of that um, 298 patients, 275 actually received CAR-T. So again, very high success in manufacturing outside of a prospective well-controlled study. Um, and this is something that can be delivered across centers. This is not something that's just done at MD Anderson in the United States. And what we also showed is that 43% of those patients would not have met the strict eligibility criteria that was applied in Zuma 1. And some of the most common reasons were their performance status was greater than one. Um, patients had thrombocytopenia. And we had 17 patients with a history of CNS involvement with their lymphoma, which would have also been an exclusion criteria. And then there were a number of other less frequent things, including having had prior allogeneic stem cell transplant. I think it was a pretty large proportion of these patients that would have met even more than one, uh, failed to meet more than one eligibility criteria. Despite that, we see very similar efficacy and safety in this essentially sicker patient population. So that we reported last year, and we have now 13 months of median follow-up. The median PFS is a little over six months, and median overall survival has not been reached. Again, replicating what we saw in the prospective study. At this meeting specifically, now we're looking into even more interesting questions. So with Zuma 1, bridging was not allowed. However, bridging has been allowed in the Juliet study and the Transcend study, so different CAR-T constructs, specifically for one bb co-stimulatory. Uh, they have a little bit longer time to manufacturing, and so that may require stabilization of those patients, whereas in Zuma 1, it was a little bit more rapid, so bridging was not allowed. At this meeting, Mike Jane looked in this consortium and described about 53% of patients did require bridging or were prescribed bridging who got standard of care AxiCell. Then he looked a little bit deeper to see well, who were those patients. And not surprising, these were patients that had poor risk features, so high LDH, poor performance status, bulky disease. So the patients that you're worried are not going to be stable while you're awaiting manufacturing. Also not surprising if you look the intent to treat population, uh, these patients had worse PFS and worse overall survival. And when you try to control for these poor risk findings, PFS was no different, but overall survival was still, still inferior. So this raises the question, what benefit does bridging provide? And so at the time when these patients were treated, we really did not have any effective treatments outside of CAR-T for third line or later. And so he showed that there really was not one bridging therapy that was more effective than the other. And potentially all you were adding was toxicity to these patients so the non-relapse mortality was higher in these patients. So it raises the question, what are we really accomplishing by trying to bridge these patients? As CAR-T moves into earlier lines of therapy where you potentially might have some effective strategies, I think that's a debatable question and should be studied. At this meeting, you'll also see some outcomes on patients with a history of CNS involvement. And what is most notable is the toxicity was not higher, even with AxiCell. Uh, that again may have higher rates of grade three or higher neurotoxicity. We did not see worse neurotoxicity of the patients that had a history of CNS disease, including some that had active CNS disease when they were treated. And efficacy appears to be similar, again, recognizing it's a small sample size. So as we get more and more experience and more patients treated with standard of care CAR T cell therapy, we'll have a better understanding of how to select patients, how to potentially mitigate toxicity, and get access to more patients.